Hello again, welcome to um, some more video lectures. This is a re-recording, uh, again I have to re-record a lecture. Um, I'm very sorry for the confusion. Apparently the, the last video I uploaded for this one uh, didn't have any audio and I'm not exactly sure why that happened. Um, I think I'm following the procedure where all these things have worked right. So hopefully that will happen again this time and there won't be a mistake. But uh, my apologies for that confusion. Sorry for another bump in the road uh, as we've been getting this uh, online class going. Um, thank you again for your patience with it. Um, hopefully this won't mess up your schedule too much here with a little delay on this lecture getting out. Um, and I'm, I remember also when I recorded this lecture days ago, um, there was some mic trouble that happened right at the end of the previous video lecture. So this is this is for language the module language of arguments. Uh, this is lecture video lecture two of two for that module. And at the end of the part one lecture, there were some garbled things that happened. I was in the other room, and I was holding the microphone, and maybe the cord was getting bumped or something like that. So I'm not going to do that anymore, um, just to make sure that they preserve the sound integrity. Kind of ironic that uh, when I recorded the, one, the part that got garbled it just became non-existent. But um, hopefully this will be solved and we'll fix that. The stuff I was talking about I think that got garbled the worst at the very end of that lecture was, here let me, let's go to the lecture notes here. Here's the stuff on Gricean maxims. It was when we were talking about, or when I was talking about, these when violations of Gricean maxims occur and what kind of meaning does that have for um, linguistic meaning? Like, what, what's, the, what's the significance of this? How should we understand it? So let's go back to our little diagram here. Remember, in this diagram, I'm this is kind of laying out these three different levels um, of meaning that contribute to the overall meaning when we're speaking and communicating with each other. Again, up here in the top row, I've got like a, some quick informal reminders of what kind of meaning we're getting. And at the bottom row here, this is a reminder, some quick notes about what's generating that meaning. So when we were talking in the last lecture about how a conversational implication gets generated, where it's coming from is this play with expectations. So um, again, as a quick reminder here, the little narrative about uh, how conversational implications generate, and this will be relevant. This this lecture right now is going to mostly cover talking in detail about the Gricean maxims we haven't talked about yet, and then me giving some more pointed, specific advice about how to answer the most difficult kind of question um, that the exam is going to ask you for this body of material, which is how is the implication generated. So remember again, the basic metaphor here, the basic narrative is taking what you literally said and did, the meaning I'm getting at the linguistic and speech act levels, and comparing that against my expectations for how you are going to behave in this communication activity. And when those things are out of whack, if it's strange, there's something weird there, is there some way that you've um, violated my expectations, that doesn't mean that we don't successfully communicate, in some cases it might, but most of the time it just sets up this drama that requires some extra interpretation, some extra speculation in order to resolve. And that's what the conversational implication is. It's, it's adding new meaning or changing the meaning based off of what we started with, this Linguistic and Speech Act stuff. The, what you literally said and what you literal, literally did. It's going to modify that in order to bring it in line with the expectations that we have. Um, and sometimes that means modifying the expectations too. Um, but the part that was getting garbled in the, at the end of the previous lecture was how I was saying that in many cases, um, it, or even though the Gricean maxims are all worded like commands or like do this, don't do this, um, they're not actually rules for successful communication. Those are just rules that uh, articulate or capture what we're sort of um, assuming about what, how people are going to behave. So people in their communication efforts, can, and we do this constantly, intentionally and purposefully and maybe egregiously and obviously violate those expectations in order to get their audience to, to um, pick up on, a, on an, something that's implied. That's how we uh, pass along implied messages. It's kind of like leaving a trail of breadcrumbs and hoping that your audience is going to piece it together. They're going to put the, they're going to connect the dots uh, in the way that you intended for them to do that. 
based on how you violated these Gricene maxims. I, I was talking about uh, one of my friends, one of my very old friends, who's a poet who always speaks in metaphor. He almost never says anything explicitly and directly like the way that you would expect at this linguistic act level. Um, and he he has uh, he has some reasons for that. His he's very opinionated about these sorts of things, but his opinions are are motivated by how um, communicating in a way that requires someone to interpret conversational implication puts the audience in a more active role. You're not allowed to be passive, or it's just going to look like nonsense to you. Um, but if you're actively listening and trying to piece it together, then you'll get the message and. He prefers that to just speaking directly because um, then uh, people will be more engaged in the conversation and be like instigated to listen a little more actively and directly. Now, I don't do that in my lectures, even though I am interested in um, having you attend and listen carefully to what I'm saying, just because of how there can be clarity issues. You're leaving that trail of breadcrumbs and maybe you don't uh, effectively anticipate what people are going to do with the breadcrumbs and so that's why we might stay explicit so when we're communicating those these my friend and my lectures are two good examples of the kind of diversity that can happen in communication and how all these levels have something to contribute to our understanding so under in certain situations maybe it does make more sense to to be super explicit and to not rely on implication um, but in other cases, it does make sense to use implication. Okay, so so much for that. I mean, we can we can set the bottom line here is that we can successfully communicate by um, speaking very directly and explicitly, or uh, and kind of following all the Gricean maxims and never violating any of them. But we can also successfully communicate through violation of the Gricean maxims. But we just have to be be careful when we're doing that. Um, but this is, like I said, we do this constantly because we like to speak efficiently with language. We want to pack as much meaning into a small enough space, and conversational implication lets us do that beautifully. Um, we can get a lot of uh, messages and meanings across to people without having to spell it all out in robot speak, that kind of thing. Okay, so I want to um, kind of do a little quick overview again of what's happening at this conversational act level of meaning in language, and then we'll talk about the Gricean maxims that we haven't talked about yet. I think we I think we talked about uh, quality um, with that example um, in my last lecture of the uh, governor has the brains of a three-year-old. We talked through the quality maxim, but we have the other three to talk about, and then I want to give some advice about, about how to tackle um, giving some of these answers in the homework and eventually on the exam. So that's the game plan here. So going back here to the beginning with Paul Grice's uh, theory of conversational implication, everything starts with this cooperation principle. All the other, that it's not one of the maxims itself, it's like the umbrella principle that all the maxims are more specific versions of. But the cooperation principle is all about, like the, the general story that Paul Grice is setting up here is that what generates implication is looking at people's linguistic behavior what they're literally saying and literally doing, linguistic and speech act levels of meaning, in the context of a purpose, of what we're here to do. Why are we communicating? What that that sense of purpose to the conversation is what's going to direct, um, and and the expectations that are connected with that purpose are what's going to direct the generation of this meaning. Um, so like last time I was talking about. Uh, these like romantic comedy movie scenes where like two people are eating dinner together one person thinks they're on a date the other person thinks they're just hanging out with a friend because they have a different understanding of the purpose of what they're engaged in they interpret each other's words very differently and hilarium ensues and they don't understand each other and it's a comedy of errors um, but that's be that that's a uh, more grist for Grice's mill here that um, what generates conversational implication is purpose and um, and the expectations that come from that purpose. So if we're thinking about the conversational implication, these implied meanings and implied doings, as something that's added onto what was literally said and liter literally did, I mean, we could, we could ask the question, where's the wiggle room here for interpretation? What, what would give us the space to do that? Because these two types of meanings are generated by really explicit one-to-one -one just decoding rules. If you know the conventions of the semantic and syntactic conventions of the language or the conventions for behavior, then what meaning you get is just one-to-one. -one. There's not any, like I've been saying, there's, no, there's nothing sneaky about it. There's no sneaky interpretation. There's no cleverness that's required. Just like match this with this. Boom, you get it. What else is there left for us to mess with 
and trying to modify the meaning of what people are doing. Like this is obvious and transparent. Well, that's where we get this idea of purposes and goals. So you'll notice here um, in the implied meanings and implied doings, the kind of meaning, linguistic meaning we get at conversational act levels is really a modification of these two. So the, there's an implied meaning like a quotation, just like the literal meaning of linguistic acts. You get a little quotation sort of answer. It's, uh, you just be here for your answer of what's the implied meaning. You just put, like, what if they had just spoken explicitly instead of used implication? How would they have worded the, their, their expression? Um, but then there's also going to be a change to what we see the person as doing by passing along that meaning, just like how speech acts, what's literally done, builds off of what, um, what, what is literally said. And this answer will always be a verb. Okay? It'll always be some kind of doing. But with conversational acts, the doing of a conversational act, we can start building in these other ideas. What do you think are the intentions and purposes of the person who's speaking? What are they trying to accomplish? What is the effect or intended effect of speaking? That's how the textbook that, that we have put it in, the, in chapter 2, um, in the chapter 2 reading. So we can speculate about that too. And when you're giving your answer for what's the conversational act, keep that stuff in mind. It could just be another type of thing like the answer you'd give for a speech act. Uh, but it can also start to build in intentions, purposes, and goals. That's where the wiggle room is because that's the only thing that's kind of an X, X factor here. The words that you have said and the actions you performed, I just have to have my eyes open and my ears open and I'll pick up on that. But it's your intentions, what you're trying to do, that's hidden from me. I'm not a mind reader. I can't see just what you're trying to do. That's not obvious to me. So that's where if there's room to like interpret what people are saying in different ways, Paul Grice is saying that's built off of the fact that we can speculate about what people's are, intentions are in different ways. So that's what gives us the wiggle room. Um, okay, so that's kind of the big picture going back at it. Now let's let's dive back into the details um, here. We've, we've already talked about quality. Quality was the maxim that just says don't say things that you believe to be false and don't say things... Uh, for which you lack adequate evidence. So I put it here in summary, don't lie and don't bullshit. That's that's basically what quality is asking for. Notice it doesn't say, uh, don't say things which are false. That would be an unreasonable expectation of people. But I can expect you to honestly and accurately portray what your actual beliefs are. So we, we've talked about quality. Um, now let's go, uh, let's go to quantity. So to talk about um, the next maxim, quantity, I actually wanted to use uh, my lectures again as, as a good example. So even though I was saying that um, with my lectures I'm trying to be totally explicit and not do anything weird or strange that would require you to be like, I wonder what Tim really meant by Paul Grice's theory is built off the cooperation principle. I mean, we're trying to I'm trying to be as direct as possible so that there's less uncertainty or interpretation that's required on your part to get what's happening. But there is still implication. Even in cases that seem like they really lack it, you can see Paul Grice's expectations at play here. Um, and my lectures, are, there's a way in which my lectures are really good illustration of quantity. So quantity is um, saying, well, here, let's go back to it. It's saying, like, don't, when you're speaking, give the right amount of information. So there's two ways that it's worded here in the text. Make your contribution as informative as is required, and don't make your contribution more informative than is required. It's kind of Goldilocks thing going on here. You gotta get it just right. Now a lot of times when this when these expectations are in play, what's happening is the person is assuming that they're getting the correct level of information based on the cooperative purpose. Um, so if you're listening to my lectures, well, okay, let's let's break this down. And the situation is not this simple, but I'm going to simplify it to make this an easier example. So if we were to ask, what's the cooperative purpose of me lecturing? Um, there's a lot of things we could say here. Hopefully, one of them is just knowledge for knowledge's sake, learning for learning's sake. That's what we're. That's my goal here is to help you learn and understand some material that is valuable and important. Um, but one thing, one other thing that's probably in, in, a part of this, maybe not the whole game, but let's pretend like it's the whole game, is uh, helping you be prepared to do well in the exams. That's, that's another purpose that we have here in this cooperative activity where I'm the lecturer and you're listening to me. Um, you're, you're, one of our hopes is that after hearing my lecture, you'll be in a better position uh, to be prepared to do well in the exam. Now, of course, school is not just a matter of exams and grades. I've talked about my feelings about that before. 
Um, but let's treat it as that just for the purposes of this example right now, just to make it a little cleaner. So if the purpose of the lecture is to prepare you for the exam, then you would be really surprised and understandably annoyed, if not furious, about certain violations of quantity that may happen. For instance, if, um, let's say I spend a ton of time talking about something, I'm like lecturing over detail and detail and detail of something, um, and then it, there's like almost nothing about it on the exam, like maybe a little true-false problem and that's it. You could, you could be understandably annoyed by that, because it's like, I assumed that that was all going to be really important stuff. Now, in, a, in the actual world where we don't just care about the exam, then there are some things that I talk about for a, an extended period of time that won't necessarily be on the exam. Like all that stuff about the code of intellectual conduct, I was like, that won't be on the exam. Still important, though. It was important information for the other purposes of this communication um, activity that we are participating in together, uh, albeit separated through the Internet. But... It's still cooperative. Um, but if, if it was all just about the exam, then that would be really infuriating. Like if you're taking an SAT prep course and your instructor's like talking about a bunch of stuff that ends up not being at all relevant for the actual SAT, you'd be pretty frustrated about it. You'd probably be more frustrated with the opposite type of mistake too. Uh, it, I mean, that would also be a mistake, but you'd probably be even more frustrated about it. If I um, spend very little time talking about something in my lectures, and then it's like most of the exam, you would be like, WTF, oh my gosh, you are the worst instructor ever, I'm not prepared, you didn't set me up for success here, and that would be extremely understandable. You're assuming, though, like you, that would be something that would have to come out in the wash later. You would be surprised at it by the time you actually got to the exam. But up until then, you'd be assuming, because you have an expectation here about quantity, you'd be assuming that what the instructor is spending time on in their lecture, and maybe the amounts of time, um, the amount of time that they spend on stuff, is going to be um, tailored to and appropriate for uh, doing well on the exam in, in, in our example here. So that's a way in which even though I'm not trying to be sneaky or speaking in metaphor constantly, there still is conversational imp uh, implication taking place. Um, so if you, for instance, if I, um, if I ask you to tell me how to do something and you speak for a while, I'm going to assume that you've given me enough information to be able to perform that task. That's going to be the tacit assumption. Um, so I'll think, I'll come away from the conversation, even if you never said it, I will assume that part of what you have conveyed to me is that this is all there is to knowing how to do this, or this is maybe at least a minimal amount required to be able to do that activity competently. That's another, another sort of example of that. So that's what's going on with quantity. That's an expectation that we have. Um, I'm going to skip relevance for the time being. Let's talk about manner. Now, this is a good one to talk about after quantity because one of the manner maxims um, one of the sub rules here, sub expectations for manner, uh, is easy to confuse with quantity. So let's talk about So the part that's easy to confuse with the quantity maxim is this part down here about being brief. So man manner's got this kind of weird, might look like a weird grab bag of things. Avoid obscurity of expression, avoid ambiguity, be brief and be orderly. But actually all of them are kind of in a theme here, kind of like the name itself of manner. Um, it's about how we're talking, how we're communicating, not just what. Like the the what comes in here with quality and quantity, like how much of it. Um, but the manner is like the way we package it up. How are we packaging what we're communicating? And one of that, uh, one of the aspects of that is how brief we are. Like how how much language we're using in order to express what we want to express. So. Um, this is also a, a quantity thing in the sense that it's a, a matter of amounts, but it's not the quantity maxim. Uh, think about it like this. Think about the quantity maxim being about how much information, okay? How much idea am I giving you? Uh, how, how much detail, say, for instructions, or how little detail? Whereas with manner and brevity, this is a matter of the amount of language. And that's actually going to be a theme I'm going to pick up on over the next couple weeks or the next couple modules um, that will show up a few times, that there's this kind of distinction between what's going on with the language and then what's going on with the ideas. And this is the first time we're really seeing that distinction uh, in the forefront. Um, brevity under manner, that's going to be an issue of language, how much language, how many words, that kind of thing, versus quantity um, and the amount of information. 
Now again, what is the right amount of language, just like with information, depends on the cooperative purpose, what we're trying to achieve. So like one of my favorite examples down here is uh, storytelling. Like um, generally, we want you to be as brief as possible in getting the information across. But if there, that, that might, might not be conducive to the conversational purpose, like if, say, in storytelling, part of the purpose is to be entertaining, then to just give all the plot information as quickly and efficiently as possible would probably not be the best way of accomplishing that purpose. Like, um, like my partner was actually in a production of Star Wars in 60 Minutes. They did all six Star Wars movies in the span of 60 Minutes. It was like a theater production. Um, and that was hilarious in its own right, but it didn't really give you the the magic uh, of Star Wars. It wasn't very equivalent to watching the movies. Um, I could probably here another example. I could like summarize Lord of the Rings for you in maybe five minutes, but it wouldn't be like reading Lord of the Rings. Like Lord of the Rings is loaded with all this other you might say unnecessary detail, but that's part of what gives it the sort of entertaining charm that it has. Like how lived in that world is and and uh, how complex and nuanced it is. And and a lot of times, you know, you just want the story to go on longer to build up dramatic tension or to form a relationship with characters, all that kind of stuff. So again, it's not just as short as possible. That's not what this is saying. It's saying as short as possible, consistent with the cooperative purpose of the encounter. And if that's something other than just being informed, like entertainment purposes, then that's that's a purpose too. That makes sense. So we might be concerned about that. Okay, let's let's talk about the rest of them on manner. Um, orderly is again how we're kind of packaging things. Um, it's the order of pre presentation. So just like you might assume from my lecture, um, you know what's going to what's going to be relevant for the exam and what's not. Um, if I ask you to for instructions for how to bake a cake, for example, I'm assuming that you're going to give me those instructions in the order in which I should perform them rather than mixing them up. If you mix them up, I mean, I'm not going to, for especially something like baking a cake, things could go horribly, horribly wrong if you mixed up the order of some of those instructions. Um, so when you give me the instructions, even if you don't say it explicitly, I'll be receiving the message that this is the order in which to do things. So like even if you don't use explicit language like first, you blah, 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 second, blah, 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 if you're just like, do this, do this, this is what you have to do, you have to do this, you have to do this, I'm going to assume that that's the right order. Um, again, depending on the particular purpose and the context, there are different things that could affect the order of, of what is the, an orderly way of presenting information. When I'm helping my 101, Philosophy 101 students write an original philosophy paper, which I make them do, um, I give them a, a actual little list of what are all the sort of variables or factors that might cause you to organize your paper one way versus another. Um, so there, there can be a lot of different factors there that might inform what is an orderly thing. But again, it'll always be determined based on what's the best way to fulfill the cooperative purpose of the encounter. That's the bottom line here. The other two uh, bits of manner are this avoid obscurity of expression, vagueness, and avoid ambiguity. There's an interesting, fun distinction here between vagueness and ambiguity. I don't, I'm not going to really care, and the exam won't care about a more precise understanding of this. The, bo the bottom line is just to be clear. Um, that being clear is a better way to communicate uh, in as much as part of our, uh, almost every um, conversational encounter will be, one of the purposes will be understanding each other, understanding what we're saying. Um, sometimes uh, the, violating the, this clarity thing can be um, a very, um, powerful indicator of some other sort of meaning. One of my favorite examples for this would be like, um, let's say it's like middle school or something and one kid asks another kid like, who do you like in the class? Or what do you think of this per person? Do you like this person like romantically? And um, if the response is something like, well, sort of, maybe this kind of, you're kind of going around uh, in circles and, and beating around the bush a little bit, well, that would carry some conversational implication there. If they're not giving a very direct answer, um, you'll immediately start wondering why why aren't they just acting, why aren't they just saying the answer directly? Maybe that indicates something. Maybe that is um, something that they're then communicating. Um, so that's that's it with manner. Let's, um, let's talk about relevance now, the one that we skipped. I like to say relevance for last um, because 
generally, my advice when you're when you're having to listen for which Gricean maxim is violated, some exercises ask you to do that explicitly, but it's it's going to be a big part of all conversational implications. So you're you're going to want to get good at this uh, of figuring out which Gricean maxim is violated. Um, my advice to students who are looking through this list and trying to figure it out is, I would say leave relevance for last. Um, there are there are two specific cases where um, that you should be listening for that are clearly relevance violations. That's kind of the domain of the relevance maxim. But it's very easy to see relevance violations in everything. Um, this relevance just says be relevant towards satisfying the cooperative goal. Well, that's there's that's kind of like just the cooperation principle. So there's going to be relevance things going on in pretty much every situation of conversational implication. Quantity, quality, uh, and manner have much more specific things, specific expectations that they're articulating. So I always tell students, listen for those first. See if there's some more specific thing that is going wrong here and uh, to look for those other violations first before saying that there's a relevance violation. Um, but that comes with a caveat. Two specific cases that you should be looking for. This situation of changing the subject and saying things out of the blue. So a couple examples from the book for these. Um, one of my one of my favorite ones is um, the one about um, what did you think of her singing? And the person says, "Oh, I thought her dress was beautiful." That's changing the subject, um, and that that's going to be strange and is going to generate some conversational implication. The saying things out of the blue. An example from the reading was that uh, when the guest says, "Man, it's getting cold in here." Like when something's just dropped without a cooperative purpose already established, or whether there already is a purpose and then the person is like moving it toward a separate purpose, then those are going to be relevance violations, absolutely. Um, there's, uh, there's some other examples I like to, to talk about in this context. One of them uh, I came up with, and I think this is a, well, actually, I'm going to save that one for a second here, because I'm going to use that as an example for how to do the exam problems well. You're getting super squirrely. Here, give me a second. Okay, I think we're all good again here. We'll see how long this lasts. Um, so one example I really like uh, using, like if I'm, when I'm in the classroom giving this lecture, I'll like go up to a student and I'll be like, do you mind if I borrow this pen? And then they say, usually, no. And then I'm like, okay, cool. Then I walk away. Like that's really strange behavior. It's strange because you're sort of left wondering like, why did he ask that question? What was the purpose of asking that question? Let's let's go back to our little diagram here. Here we go. Um, so when I say, do you mind if I borrow your pen? I'm literally saying in robot speak, if we're just looking at semantic and syntactic conventions of the language, I'm saying something like, would you be emotionally disturbed in the event that I was to temporarily assume possession and control and domination of your pen? That's that's kind of what I'm asking. I'm, I'm, and what am I doing? I'm asking a question. I'm inquiring uh, after the emotional dispositions of the person I'm speaking to. That's all I'm doing. Um, but that seems strange. Like people don't just do that randomly. We're, we're, if we don't have a purpose established, we're going to go looking for one, and that might generate some more implication. What, what's the implied meaning in this situation is probably something like, "May I borrow your pen?" And what would I be doing? Making a request, not inquiring after your emotional dispositions, but making a request of you and that's what's going on even though that's not what I literally said it's not what I use the syntactic and semantic conventions of English to express um, so that implication is generated based on the fact that there wasn't a clear implicate uh, there wasn't a clear purpose to just taking it literally now again like th this example is a good example of how fast we reason about this stuff um, how quickly that little intuitive voice in our head puts the pieces together, we're just, everyone would hear instantly from, do you mind if I borrow your pen, to may I please borrow your pen. That's, you know, that, we would we'd make that jump pretty effortlessly because um, we're so good at piecing these things together, especially for something that's very common and ordinary like that. There's an easy purpose. We don't, we don't go, whoa, that's weird for very long. We're like, oh, I get it, uh, because that's why people would... Why, why would it be relevant for me to inquire after your emotional states about the pen transfer of ownership um, unless I wanted it? <laughs> that's kind of the story that's going on behind there. Um, okay, and let's let's talk about this other uh, example I invented. And I'm going to use that to segue here now into 
um, the discussion about how to answer these problems on the exam. Um, and let, let's actually just refresh ourselves really quickly. Uh, at the end, these are the instructions for the Chapter 2 homework. I listed here at the end these uh, five questions. This is what it's going to look like on the exam. I'm going to give you some situation where people are talking with each other, gives you some context. I'm going to underline what are the under, one of the utterances in that little interaction and ask you these five questions about it. I'm going to ask for the literal meaning. That's linguistic act level of meaning. I'm going to ask for the speech act, speech act level of meaning, what's being done. What's the implied meaning and the conversational act? That both is happening at this conversational act level, implied meanings, implied doings. And then, and those are all quick answers, uh, like I've been saying. They're kind of quick, short, one word, one sentence sorts of things. But then for how the implication is generated, that's where you're going to have to write a paragraph for me. This is going to be a little, little more challenging. Um, and let's, let's do a simple example that I've got. As a, as a really good paradigmatic example for what I might throw at you on the exam. And we'll talk through each of these, and then I'm going to give you some advice about how to tackle this really tricky fifth one. Okay, so here's the situation. Patient goes into... What are you doing, buddy? You're growling. Growling at me. It's a little too soon for that, buddy. Okay, you can get at, mad at me when you're like one, right? I don't know. Um, okay, so here's the situation. Patient goes into a doctor's office. They've met previously to do some tests. Uh, patient asks the doctor, it's okay doctor, you can tell me, do I have cancer? And then the doctor says, I'm sorry. So I want to analyze the, the utterance of the doctor here, that when the doctor says I'm sorry. So let's go through it one by one. I might actually change the order of these things. So let's put this down here. And, and there we go, that's good. Okay, so What's the literal meaning? we got to figure that out first. Um, literal meaning here, again, if we translate in robot speak, get out of thesaurus. Doctor saying something like, they said, I'm sorry. It's saying, I apologize. Okay, that's what's happening there, literally. Um, or, I, I'm in a state of contrition or something like that. I, I'm sorry. What's the speech act? I think a really good answer here would be something like apologizing. That's what he's doing. When you say, I'm sorry, what are you doing? You're apologizing. Nice, simple answer here. Don't have to get sneaky about this stuff. What's the implied meaning? I think pretty much all of us are going to say something like uh, the, the implied meaning here of the doctor's utterance is, yes, you do have cancer. Like, that's, that's the answer here. And then what are they doing as a conversational act? Well, this is an interesting answer because what they're doing is answering the question. And that's interesting because they didn't do that as a speech act. Apologizing doesn't answer a question. That's not what, what's happening. But if the meaning is really, if the message they're painting with their words that they're passing along to the patient is, yes, you do have cancer, that would answer the question. Okay. So those are all the simple answers there for the first four questions. Not too much going on. Those answers would be full credit answers if this was an exam problem and I was grading it. Um, but now we've got to talk about this last one, how the implication is generated. So um, the... Here, look here. Sip of water. I haven't, there's no surprises here. Everything we've been talking about so far is still in line with what I want you to, I've kind of already given you the instructions, but just to lay it out super, super clearly, um, think about your answer for explaining how the implication is generated as involving four things. Kind of at a big picture level here, your job is to explain your thought process to me, your reasoning, in a way that may not be explicit, even if it's an intuitive voice in your head sort of thing. That's what we're trying to, we want to reflect on that intuition and see Oh, what's going on back there? How did how did we arrive here? What is the implicit logic to my intuitive thinking? Let's make that explicit. Um, so to do that, to walk through the logic of how implication is generated, informed by Paul Grice's theory of implication, there's four things that have to get talked about. First, the two things that are going to kind of structure this narrative, telling the story. How'd you get from the literal meaning to the implied meaning? What's what's the story? How do we connect the dots here? Um, to do that, there's two main movements to the drama. The breach, the disconnect between the expectations and what you literally said and did. And then the resolution, how adding the implied meaning, how interpreting things in accordance with that implied meaning re fixes the situation, makes the thing make sense when it didn't make sense before. You are so noisy. Is that coming in on the microphone? 
That's so cute. I'm sorry if that's a distraction here. Let's get you to quiet down, buddy. Oh, he's passed out, so sleepy. Um, so there's a breach, and then there's the resolution. Um, the other two components are different types of expectations that inform how we listen and hear a conversational implication. Um, and they, they roughly correspond with those two movements. So let's go back to our little diagram. Here that we were talking before about how there's general and specific expectations that inform and generate these implications. So if we're trying to figure out the breach, the disconnect that happens between my expectations and your behavior, that's generally going to be where the Gricean maxims are going to come into play. So it's, it's the Gricean maxims that Paul Grice argues are Oh, buddy. Those are our universal expectations for people's behavior and conversation, regardless of the context. Um, or it takes something very specific in the context to override those expectations specifically. Like my example of, of um, a chronic liar. I'm like, I know some things about you now. I'm, my expectation is not that you will follow the quality maxim and be truthful and honest in reporting your beliefs. I know you. So, but. The Grice maxims, Grice would, Paul Grice would still say, are the defaults. It's where we start from, and it takes something else to offset that. So generally, the Gricean maxims are going to be what provokes us. A violation of a Gricean maxim is what's going to provoke us to go looking. It's going to create the space where we need an implied meaning to fill the gap. Um, when we talk about the resolution, then we're going to probably have to, to explain that, we're going to have to mention the background assumptions and knowledge that we use to inform that. So with our doctor exam doctor patient example, let's walk through that and you can see those four things at play. So first we gotta explain what was strange. Here there's a relevance violation going on because the doctor is technically changing the subject. Um, when the patient asks a question, that's establishing a purpose for the conversational interaction. They want their question answered. That's now the cooperative purpose of the encounter. When the doctor doesn't answer the question, when they're apologizing instead, they're not behaving in a way that is relevant to accomplishing the cooperative goal. So that's weird. So we could say that. We could say, literally, the doctor didn't answer the question. By saying, I'm sorry, they didn't answer the question. They apologized. That doesn't answer the question. So that's strange. Gricean maxim of relevance is being violated here. But to explain the implication, how does the implication solve that? Well, the first thing we would say is that, well, the, the implied meaning, which we which I was saying we're probably thinking earlier is going to be something like, yes, you do have cancer, that is a relevant response to a question. So that solves that problem. But there's more to explain here. There's a lot of ways that the doctor could have given a relevant response to the question. They could have said, yes, you have cancer, of course, but they could have said, no, you don't have cancer, uh, we don't know, the results are inconclusive, I'm not going to tell you, or you know, there's a lot of other things that could have been said here. Why did we choose that particular one? Why did we choose the particular implied meaning of, yes, you do have cancer? There's going to be some specific background assumptions or background knowledge that we have about the world that's informing that interpretation. Um, and I think in particular here, there's, there's two pieces of information that help us connect the dots from the literal meaning to this implied meaning, why we picked this particular one. First is a sort of understanding that people sometimes apologize even for things that aren't their fault. So that's needed here. Like, unless the doctor like gave the patient cancer, the the apology is is sort of strange unless it's understood that people sometimes apologize for things that aren't their fault. So that's one thing. But probably more pressing here is the background assumption that getting cancer is bad. So if people apologize for things that are bad, even if they're not their fault, in order to make that interpretation, we also need that puzzle piece in play to make that leap in logic that having cancer is bad. If having cancer was good, then when the doctor says, I'm sorry, that would generate the implication, no, you don't have cancer. If, if having cancer was a good thing, be like, I'm sorry, you don't have cancer. This is, this is a good example I like to use because it illustrates how a lot of the background assumptions that I want you to build into your explanation of how the implication is generated can be like right in your face or the kind of stuff that's so easy to take for granted. But it's still good for us to see what we're taking for granted and how we're piecing that together because sometimes the assumptions are more controversial or we don't think they're controversial. We assume it's common sense, but maybe the other people we're talking to have different background assumptions. So that helps us to be better communicators and to be able to diagnose when miscommunication has happened 
what's been going on. So that's a good good habit to get into and a good skill to practice. Okay, so with any of your answers uh, to how the implication is generated, you'll know you'll have a good answer on your hands if your explanation is hitting all those four things. Explaining the breach, the disconnect between expectations and how the person spoke. Um, explaining how the implied meaning resolves that problem. And then along the way, talking about definitely need to talk about Gricean maxims here. There won't be a problem on the exam that explicitly asks for Gricean maxims, but you can't explain how the implication is generated without them. So you'll have to identify Gricean maxim violations to do that. And you'll have to, along the way, bring up the background assumptions that are informing your interpretation. Those are going to be different for different people, and that's okay. I just want to hear yours. Um, that's why I'm, I don't just grade your answers on the exam based on what I would say. But I need to see you very, very clearly articulating your thought process. So I can tell whether, given your background assumptions, you're using this analytic process properly. That's, what, that's much more important than learning Tim Linneman's background assumptions and being conversant with them. What, what matters more is how you're using them and your, your competency with understanding how these universal principles apply, regardless of what background assumptions you've got. All right, so uh, that lecture went a little quicker than my last one that I recorded here. Uh, I don't know if that's maybe because I'm leaving some things out because um, it's been a little while or something, but I think I've got everything. Um, if you got some questions, some more things you want to ask about, uh, come to the study sessions Monday and Thursday, 6 to 8 p.m. Um, or if that time doesn't work for you, find a way to get in contact with me. Looking over the homework problems and diagnosing your answers, so important. Especially, like, maybe you can see why I'm, I'm so interested in that. Because right off the bat here, we've got some homework exercises that require you to do this explanatory work where it's really not straightforward what the right answer is. It's going to be these things that might you might say are like fuzzy answers. There still is right and wrong here. They're still doing better and worse, even if it's more on a sliding spectrum rather than black and white. Um, there still is there are still some standards here, and we can calibrate and help you uh, improve the quality of that. Um, so, boy, you okay, um, Sorry, <laughs> it's noises. Um, so let's be in conversation about it. Please reach out to me. Um, let's calibrate it. Let's go over the answers and see if they make sense. I'm, I'm providing my answers in a text document, but it's always better to have that human touch. So um, please reach out to me or come to the study sessions and we can get that all calibrated up. Okay. I'll see you next time. I just forgot. I did not give you the code. So we got to give you a code too. So let's see here. Um, code... Code. Um, and this, by the way, this will be the code that will cover uh, this video and the part one video. So I'm just going to have one quiz this time to handle both of them. I might switch that up in the future, but for right now, just one code. You get the credit for all three hours of, of video that you've watched. Um, let's do snoring, because that's what he, Baby was totally doing earlier. I hope that snoring was not too loud in the microphone. But snoring, that's the code this time. So put that in there. And uh, I can't remember what code I had last time I recorded this. So we'll go with snoring. That's it. All right, thanks.